Welcome to the digital painting workshop. We're going to be doing a workshop that I normally do while I'm traveling. Um, this is the 2016 version. It's just basically a breakdown of the way I digitally paint in Photoshop. It is going to be Photoshop focused, but a lot of what we're going to be talking to now today can actually be translated to pretty much any program. The workflow is not it's program agnostic. You can really take what we're talking about here and kind of go other places. There are a couple of things that tool-wise are going to be Photoshop-centric, but most of the stuff we're talking about can can be used in other places. Um, and it's it, I'm working in Photoshop CC, but I know that a lot of the things that I'm going to be doing today you can use in pretty much any version of Photoshop. Uh, but before we get started, this file that you see open right now can actually be downloaded on my DeviantArt page, saushin.deviantart.com. If you look at my gallery, there's a resources and tutorial gallery, um, and it's a PSD that's sitting in there. It's, it's this, this file that I have open is no different than the file that you can download. In the same uh, gallery, you can also find the link to the brushes that I'm going to be using, which are these guys right here. They're the Photoshop brushes that I'm going to be talking about today. You still there, Josh? I am. Uh, okay. You want to introduce yourself and, and me? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Eric. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm Josh. I'm here for uh, to relay some of the questions that are kind of going right. to come in through the chat. And I'm also going to ask some of my own as he goes and try to make this more of a conversation. Yes. Josh is going to be slowing me down a bit because I, I tend to take off when I talk about my, my, uh, my process. Now, slow anyway, down a second. When you say yeah. process, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> I, like that was the process. That was baiting. Okay, um, cool. But anyway, uh, focus of today's workshop is this baby Bowser. Uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about are some of the tools in Photoshop. Uh, if you're familiar with the streams and the videos on YouTube, you've noticed that I'm always like in this this kind of setting. This is called full screen mode. When you first open Photoshop, it'll look windowed like this. Uh, the reason I like working in full screen is because you kind of lock the canvas. Uh, if I wanted to, I can't really drag over to the sides as, as freely as I can in full screen. And hitting F on your keyboard will bring you into that full screen mode. Hitting F again brings you into like a pro mode. It kind of hides all the tools. Uh, but I don't feel that pro. so. This, this maintains the ability to move that canvas around off the screen uh, and keep all the palettes open. The other thing I have open are the history. I usually have history kind of small because I only really need to see a few states. Um, the layers here and uh, uh, my little palette, which is a free-floating palette that I move around. A lot of times when you open Photoshop, it might look like this. Um, I just don't like it like that. I like it when it's a little more condensed and compact. Uh, so we'll, we'll go ahead and talk about some of the shortcuts also. The shortcuts in Photoshop are pretty easy to remember just because usually the first letter of the, the shortcut is the what it is, except for in situations like the hand tool <laughs> is actually spacebar. It actually turns your cursor into a hand, and then this is where you can actually move the entire document around. If you watch the streams, you'll notice that I'll be doing this a lot. Uh, it probably drives everyone crazy. It's um, hitting R and then holding it down. Well, as long as you're holding it, you can actually rotate the canvas. As soon as you let go, it goes back to the brush or whatever tool you were using before. And then hitting escape will just bring it back to the, uh, the orientation where top is up. Um, and then other tools. B, B is the brush tool. <coughs> e is the eraser tool. So as you can see, it's pretty, pretty easy. And then V is move. I don't know why it's not M because M is marquee, but V is another tool I use a lot and that's how I can move the uh, the actual individual layer around. And so those are probably the things I use the most. Um, if you're new to Photoshop, one of the things that's the big thing about Photoshop is the layers. Layers are over here. Essentially layers are um, just stacks of glass basically. If you If I color on this and then make another layer underneath, and use a different color and go underneath it. As you can see, the layer on top is independent. Layer on bottom is also independent. And anything on top is seen first, anything on the bottom is seen next. So that's all that really means. That's one of the most confusing parts about Photoshop when you first open it up, I think. 
Um, another thing is when you've got a bunch of layers open like this, if this is like a piece of something I have on here, if, I, if I'm on the move tool, I can actually control and click that and it'll actually be selected for me. So if I open this one on the bottom and I'm on this, this layer, I can actually control and click the top one and that'll allow me to quickly select that one layer. It's kind of a lifesaver in some situations. Um, and then uh, the only other thing I'm going to talk about for the for the workspace is basically some of the uh, pressure sensitivity and blending. And that's because uh, I use a tablet. If you're really going to be doing any digital painting, I'd recommend buying a tablet. And that's really just because when you're using Photoshop with a tablet, uh, and especially using my brushes, and I'm going to be demoing it here with this first brush, if you touch lightly, let me use a darker color. I can't see what I'm doing. If you touch lightly, the, the size is small and very transparent, but as I get uh, harder and harder, it becomes more and more opaque. You can see this really well with the scratch brush that I always use. And that's just me going between hard and soft pressure. Why is it called a scratch brush? Oh, it's called a scratch brush only because like the edges are rough. So it, it gives it kind of a uh, scratchy edge. Does that have any sort of uh, real world analog? Yes. So this brush would be more like a, um, uh, like a feathered brush, like a round, or, or maybe even a filbert. A filbert would be a little like this. It kind of produces kind of roughed edges, and it's uh, better to kind of feather in colors, I think, anyway, versus something like an airbrush, which is you know completely soft along the edges and the middle. Uh, and you just started blending in this too, but that's something you're going to explain later. Yeah. So basically, in order to blend colors together, a lot of people ask me, you know, hey, how do you, how do you, how do you blend the colors? Do you use the blur or do you use the smudge tool? So what I actually do is, let's take like a blue for example. I'm going to touch this side lightly, or actually, this is very opaque. So that's a very opaque color, and I'll take red. Put it over here. Uh, this is also pressing, pressing with a very hard color, or a hard pressure sensitivity. If I touch lightly, you can see it's very light colored. It's kind of transparent. And then on this side, I'll do the same thing. So what I do to blend is I actually come between the two colors and kind of lightly touch. And you can and see that it's causing, yeah, just light pressure. So, so that means that your opacity is, is lowered when you do that. Yeah, and that's all tied in. So you can see here that my opacity for my brush is all the way up to 100%. But it's the variation uh, is based on pressure sensitivity. So when I touch lightly, it's allowing that color pass through to come through. So what I do is if I want to really blend it, I'll pick that new color that was created when I passed over the color with lighter sensitivity. And then just do it again, and do it again, and then do it again, and then do it again. That's why you see that hoop come up so many times when I uh, paint, because basically what I do, and this is the tool I use a lot, I, I'm on B for brush, and then Alt, while you hold it down, brings up the quick eyedropper tool. And the reason I do the quick eyedropper tool while is because when I let- you hold what down? Alt or Option. Option, Alt or Option, yeah. okay. Yeah, Option on a Mac, Alt on a, on a PC. So as long as I'm holding it down, the eyedropper is up. As soon as I let go, it's back to the brush. That way I'm not interrupting the, the workflow. Like I'm not like pushing B and then pushing whatever the eyedropper tool. I yeah, it's I. <laughs> it's I. <laughs> you know because it's spelled eyedropper. <laughs> but yeah, I, instead of pushing the two different brushes, I'm just holding Alt down while I want it active. And so when I push down when Alt is pressed, you see the hoop come up. The color on the top is act is the color it will become once you let go. The color on the bottom is or it will it was the active color. So if I want to take this color, for example, as soon as I let go, it's back to that, and now I have that as my new color. So without opening this thing multiple times, I've actually created all these new colors here just by doing this particular blending method. And I can even take the white and then come in here. And... So yeah, I don't use blur, I don't use smudge, I don't do anything like that. I'm basically stacking the colors by selecting between them. and that's. I know if you've listened to the stream or in the, uh, the YouTube videos, you'll hear that tapping constantly while I'm painting. And that's because I'm just color picking between these. 
these colors. And so when you zoom out, I'm really zoomed in here so you can really see just how how scratched up that is. But as soon as I zoom out, it kind of looks a little more feathered. But you can do this with any of my brushes, basically, that have the feathered edges. Like if I use the uh, watercolor brush, or rather the airbrush here, it's actually going to be a little easier to see just how, how that's working. And you get a, uh, you get a better like transition that's a lot more smooth. It's just the only reason I use a scratch brush is because that's just part of my style. I, I, I like the way it looks when it's uh, zoomed out because it gives a lot of texture. Um, why why not just use like the blur tool or something? Why not use blur? Yeah. Um, it's a lot slower. <laughs> so you can use blur. Uh, where is it? It's over here somewhere. I I think you are looking at the one like just right next to the one that's actually a, a finger. <laughs> <laughs> so so blur is here here's me using blur. I'm not getting quite the variation I want. What is it? Strength is really low. Is I guess it's it might be smudge that I'm, I might be thinking. Oh, about. this yeah, and smudge is kind of the same thing. Who smudge has brush? It can. Qualities? See look look it's happening. Oh god. It's taking forever. Yep. So while that's happening, <laughs> it doesn't always. It's just, it depends on the brush. And of, of course, I have a really big file open, and it's a really high resolution file. The The reason I don't like it, though, uh, and it finally stopped, uh, is because when you really look at it, I'm going to circle it. When you really zoom in on it, I've lost all the really nice, sharp edges that I had. And while I get some of the really nice, smooth transitions, I've lost the kind of like painted look that I really go for. And that's why I don't use smudge or yeah, why I don't use smudge. Blur kind of does the same thing. I, I just prefer the appearance of dry paint on dry paint. And that's that's really all it is. I, it's again with this workshop and I, I kind of say this every time I give to this workshop, this process that I'm explaining right now, it's not the, the process everyone should take. It's just what I do. Um, I never want anyone to think that this is the way you have to do it. It's just what I enjoy doing. It's what I've developed. Uh, and I, you know, I used to do things like smudge the, the colors together. I still do that for some situations now. Um, if that's what you're comfortable with, you should keep on doing it. But yeah, I, I kind of have a drier paint look than, than kind of this stuff right here. So I am, where are we at? Okay, so. Basically, where we want to start now is, um, I know a lot of people, they draw um, on paper, you know, so, like, and they scan their work in or they take a photo of it, um, you know, and they bring it in digitally, and they want to know, how do I, how do I now then paint this? Like, because what happens is Photoshop does not know the difference between what you've drawn and then what the stuff is in the background, the white. So if I made a new layer underneath this, and try to uh, you know color. It's not going to show up because it's all opaque. I could bring it up above the layers, but then that's not really helping either. So what we need to do is basically separate the white out from the line art. And the way I do this is basically with the channels. The channels. So wanna, the channels. That's separating the R G B and all that other stuff. But you want to use this like dashy line thing right here. What's that? What okay. that doing is it's selecting all the white in the image. So go back. What's to the layers. what's the tooltip on that dashy line thing? Oh, what does it say? Uh, yeah, I, I just what does the tool actually say? Describe itself as <sighs> low channel as selection. Yeah. Uh -huh. So yeah, you're, the channel is white basically, and you're you're just selecting that. You're gonna come back here, make a new layer. And right now, since it's selecting the white, what we want is actually the reverse of that. So if you use the marquee or the lasso tool, you can actually say, um, oop, I just unselected everything. You want to select the inverse. And now what that's doing is selecting everything opposite of white, including the scale of, of black and white. And what we want to do is we now want to fill that in with black. So if I drop that and your Layer. your fill your fill tool was set I just used to contigu contiguous all layers what no just to yeah it's contiguous but it's it's only in the selection so if I turn this layer back on which is the sketch layer you know and move it around um, right. you'll see that the line art is now separate 
Uh huh. Yeah. So if I drop that layer out and then make a new layer, that's now our background layer. If I go back to the paint and now paint underneath that new line art, you can see that now I can paint underneath it and it is like transparent. So now in this case, I can go ahead and cool. uh, go ahead and paint his hair. Oh, we lost Josh. We'll try to get him back. You mm -hmm. know, and I can paint his hair. Welcome back. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, you for a second. And then I paint his face. Whatever, you, you can understand what I'm saying. But like, that's basically how you separate the line art out. But the really, what I do is since this is a sketch, um, I don't always draw it out like this. I just did it for the benefit of like people who are bringing that stuff in. But even if I were to bring it in as a sketch like this, I would drop the opacity down, make a new layer, and I'd actually do the line art. So the way I do my line art, again, with these brushes that I've developed, it's always with this first brush, this like really weird egg. Um, and then I just kind of go at it. A lot of people ask me, how do you do line art so clean? I honestly could not tell you like one specific way that I do it. It, it just kind of happens. You, The more and more you do it, uh, the better, but you'll when I do the line art, you'll see me rotate the canvas like a million times because I like to come at everything with a certain angle of attack, which is more comfortable for me. I'm right-handed, so a lot of times you'll see the the canvas turning towards the left. But really, that's that's it. Like it's it's about a lot of brushing away or erasing the lines, making sure that you have nice line art variation in the width. You know, because if everything is one width, it's kind of a Kind of, it doesn't really give it that inked in look, but just for have, the. Hmm? Do you have the opacity changing on on pressure with this line art? Or? Yep. Yeah, all of my brushes do that basically. Yeah. So if I press harder, it'll be much harder. But with line art, it's all really about feathering. I usually feather stuff together like this. Huh. Yeah, but you want to make like smooth, confident, like long strokes you move your arm quickly on a tablet, you'll kind of get that nice, clean, I guess, look. But anyway, just because line art takes a really long time and I don't want to waste everyone's time, I've, I've already done it. <laughs> oh boy, that sounds like cheating. It isn't, because there I did it. It's not like I made a computer do it for me. Mm. But anyway, this, this is the cleaned up line art, basically where I arrived uh, before we started and uh, I spent the time to kind of clean it up and everything. But basically, it's it's the same thing. If I put the, the reference back up you can, and move it back underneath them, you can kind of see it's, uh, you know, I, in the line art, I usually clean up a little bit too. Uh, now, do you sketch. use line art for all of your paintings or? Yes. Just. It may not be this clean. Um, in, my, in my newer drawings, like the ones where we're doing Pokemon, you'll see me doing less and less line art just because they're more simple. So I don't need as much of a guideline when I'm doing the color. And really the lines are just there to kind of keep me on track, I guess. Mm. But I, I don't I don't start off just with blocks of color. I always do some sort of a line, line art, even if it's not going to appear in the end. But uh, this is only because if you've watched the streams before, like you'll see me sketch out the thing and then immediately do a color block underneath. Um, the line arts are kind of untouched until I start painting them. And we'll, we'll get to that and you'll see how they get integrated into the, the painting layer. But uh, once I have the line art through, what I want to do is create, um, you know, basically a mask underneath it so that all the paint and all the color are going to go on to. So what I do is just kind of like create a block of color that, well, I usually use gray or some color that I think is close to the figure color and kind of just go around and, and color underneath everything. And again, this takes a little bit, so we'll just pretend I did it all. So now this is basically everything that is the figure, anything that's not the background. Right, right. Anything that I'm going to actively paint in the next few stages. Um, so really I only have... Hmm? Uh, just for curiosity sake, what does that look like without lines over it? So it's like, kind of like a little a messier, but it doesn't... Yeah, yeah. just because the lines help clean up the edge a little bit. Right, interesting. We only have two layers active, the line art layer and the mask. And I call it a mask because that's basically the the, the space that I'm going to paint onto. And here's where we, we I, I say clipping mask a lot, and here's how I do it. When I create a new layer above that mask, 
and you can either right click it and say create a clipping mask what you see me do a lot is actually hold the alt or option button between the two layers and you'll see this little like arrow with the the box come up and if you click it it creates the situation where the layer on top is then pointing down to this one so you can think about this layer being a slave and this being the uh, the master layer and what what that basically does is tell Photoshop that anything that's painted on the top layer it will only show up where the bottom layer is so as you can see here let's just say I'm going crazy with this and I'm all over the place you only see it showing up where the gray is the mask that I created basically the um, the master layer if I unlock them you'll see that oh it, it, it's all over the place simply because that's ex that's actually what I did I was really sloppy with it so pushing that back down and creating that clipping mask again you can see I can move this independently I can also move this independently you know and they stay in place if they are not the active layer that I'm moving around but this will then become now my my uh, my painting layer um, well so if there's gonna be a lot of different colors going into this Bowser why not do a clipping mask for every single color section for every color so yeah you could like you could say like the yellow section of his mouth could be one layer and, you know and actually that's that's how I used to do it um, every every color was its own clipping mask its own layer that had like hundreds of layers um, and that's fine like if you want to do it that way the reason I don't is because I've gotten closer and closer to how I would have traditionally painted something and you just can't do that right so what what would happen is when I would retain the colors all on on their own layers or their own clipping mask it wouldn't look as cohesive in the end you know the colors wouldn't blend together they wouldn't like the edges here especially like between the green of his head and the yellow of his face there'd be this very distinct section uh, where they didn't blend together and it was a look that I wasn't liking anymore that and if I had a bunch of variables like that I would constantly change my mind or go back and redo it and it just it would take much longer for me to finish a drawing when I had the options to go back and kind of second guess everything, right? If I second guess all the layers, then I have just basically allowed myself to kind of like tweedle with everything until I'm done. If I'm just doing everything on one layer, it makes me commit to it much more fast. Um, it's just a workflow thing. It, I know a lot of people like to retain all of this stuff so they can go back and fix something or whatever. And honestly, there are times where I'm like, Ah, uh, damn it, you know, I wish I had, now i got to redo this whole section because I don't like it, but I can tell you more often than not, I don't do that. I don't go back and second guess, I just kind of go forward, um, and, you know, I kind of never really go back and try to fix something to the smallest degree that only I'll notice, so that's the only reason I don't do all the layers, or all the colors on their own layer. Full steam ahead. Yeah, pretty much. So, right here, I'm actually going to go ahead and stop with talking about kind of the the demo stuff but really what we're, we're going to do now is kind of think about lighting um, because in these early stages especially if you watch me in the stream you'll notice that I kind of lay down colors really sloppily in the beginning and then they kind of get more and more refined as we get closer and closer to doing detail work um, and that's because right here right when I've done this part is actually when I start thinking about lighting so in this particular drawing um, I've decided that the light that I want to do is from behind. I think it's really common. I've actually noticed this and I laughed the other day that almost in all of my drawings, you'll notice that I have the lighting going, coming in from the opposite direction of the face. I hardly ever have the lighting coming in from like this side or from the top. I don't know what it is. I, I think it may be that I think it looks more interesting. But in this way, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do the lighting from from this side. He's going to, the lighting will spill over the back. Uh, and roll over his face and then come they'll be backlighting on this side uh, that's kind of more realistic too like most lighting is going to be coming from somewhat overhead. yeah I mean it it's just better interest I think yeah but right here we're gonna go ahead and turn Bowser off for a moment and really talk about lighting and I'm gonna bring up an image that I'm sure everybody has seen tons and tons of times and it's this thing um, it's this sphere now the reason I, I bring up the sphere in the workshop and I remind everyone to really not just look at this and be like, yeah, yeah, it is, it's because it's so, so important. I've, I've drawn the sphere in the same lighting direction that we'll, we'll be using. And I know that everybody's seen it and they've practiced it and you know they, they get it, but I'm gonna explain it again. When you have your, your sphere and it's a really easy object because it's just a ball 
So your lighting source is coming down from here. It's creating a highlight. It's creating a section of light coming from, you know, it's, it's obviously coming from this side. It then casts a shadow. The shadow is called a shadow core. And then the light keeps passing by. It creates a shadow. Uh, the shadow on the surface that the sphere is sitting on will be kind of more intense and a harder edge closer to the sphere. And as it gets further away, it starts to fade away. And any light that hits this surface will then cast and be reflected back at the ball, which is why you see a bit of lighting on this edge here. Now, I know that everybody sees it and they understand it because the sphere is easy to understand lighting. But the reason you see it so much is because it applies to complex forms as well. Let me turn that back on, actually. So if you look at this sphere and then take this sphere and then think about this muzzle, which is a complex form, and just then think about it as a sphere, you'll see how this then actually translates to over here. So these two are spheres, and this here is like a, I don't know, like a pinto bean. It's actually just the same lighting. So lighting is coming from this side, it's casting the shadow. Lighting is coming from the side and casting that shadow. There's the reflected light, and then without the guidelines, you can see here that it creates this 3D look on this very complex form. So when you look around you, you know, sometimes things are spheres, sometimes they're boxes, sometimes they might be a pinto bean, that lighting is still going to apply, you know, and if you understand this, you're going to understand this. And of course, it does get more complex, like this nose overhangs over this sphere, so it might cast its own little shadow here. But those are, those are details, and, they, and the more sophisticated a form gets, the more sophisticated that lighting gets. But for things like this, you should be thinking about this. So knowing, knowing that, let's go back. Let's go back to Bowser. Now, back we can Bowser. already... Yeah, back to Bowser. We can already tell that this right here, that's a sphere. It's the same idea. Is it? It is. But it's it's got, not. It's got a little chain on there. It's not a trapezoid, believe it or not. Okay. So let, let's take a dark color. We're gonna I'm going to just stay in grayscale so it's easy to understand. We're going to put that core shadow in. Wait, We're going to put that highlight. It's mm -hmm. perfect now, right? It's done. You just add a shadow. Is, that's... And, and that's it, right? That's it, right? <laughs> that's it. Now with Bowser, the cheek very sphere like we'll put a little shadow here highlight on this side you know we'll take the shadow all the way to the other side of the face highlight on the nose you know the horns are kind of like a cylinder so there's gonna be a highlight on one side and a shadow that horn is gonna then cast a shadow on his face but as you can see the way I'm gonna think about lighting again is this rule that I know that the lighting is coming from this side so I know that his entire body on this side will be more in shade than this side of the body, which will be in highlight. And then you're so thinking just, about the 3D shapes that hold those. Like if each of the 3D shapes is some deformation of that sphere. Right. Then Right. Like this, this is just a cylinder. So it's right. going to have that shadow. It's going to have that cast light reflected back at his arm. But yeah, just really quickly, just starting with big shadows first, like I did that whole section of his body in a big shadow, and then I go back and I think about, okay, well that's going to be in light, this is going to be in shadow, this is going to have a little bit of a reflection here, his tail is kind of like a cylinder, there's a little bit of a reflection. So yeah, I mean, all I'm doing is thinking about each of those little sections and then getting smaller and smaller and smaller in the shadows, like I'm going to get a little more dark here, you know, I'm going to get a little more dark under the chin. So really I'm, I'm thinking about everything and if you're I know a lot of people do actually paint this way in grayscale first and they add those colors in later it is actually very helpful I don't do it um, but it is a very good exercise in thinking about shadows because you're not the colors are not distracting you essentially if you were to do that could you just like paint like maintain the, the highlights that you've established in grayscale and kind of paint yeah, over sure. them with color yeah, I, I don't do it just because I don't get the vibrancy I want out of it. There are some people that really do it well, and I, I just I just don't get the same sort of color saturation that I want. No, I wasn't trained to do it this way either. But anyway, mm -hmm. anyway, the the point is, just zooming out a little bit, you're kind of seeing the form starting to appear underneath here. And that's all thinking about everything like this. So now that we... We've got the lighting idea down. Um, going back to Bowser, I'm going to make a new layer, actually. I'm going to just do the same thing, but with color. So I'm going to start with 
well, what color is his face? Like, tannish, right? His face is purple. I don't think that's true. But basically, no. no? Oh, wait, it's this color. And then his face is kind of like that tannish color on the other side. And his, his, oh, his face, this part, is like red, I think. Right? Or is it green? You know, there's a very easy way to check. <laughs> it's green. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the darker sense. colors are going to go on the uh, the side away from the light. Lighter colors coming closer. It, so, it is green. Yeah, it is. I remembered. Um, what we're going to do now is... I, I kind of cheated and already established this color, color palette, but we're, we're, we're actually going to talk about why I chose these colors now. Uh, a lot of people, I think when they pick colors... And we're, let me go up to this. Oh, okay. When they pick colors, and I'm going to take this yellow as an example because yellow is a really good example. So if I take this and I make this yellow swatch, let's say I'm going to rebuild a uh, new color palette. Now the mistake, and I, well, let me not say it's a mistake. Let me say that a way that some people do it is to move this down towards black, basically, and they make the next color. And they move it down towards black again, and they make the next color. They move it down one more time, make the next color. Move it down again. And what's make the next color. what's the value they're actually changing when they do that? They they are only changing value. Value oh, value is, as in yeah value is light to dark. So as I get closer and closer, it is truly getting darker because the value is dropping. But look what the problem is. In this color palette, looks like it's deadening. Right? It's it's getting grosser. It's it's getting murkier. It doesn't look Poopier. as vibrant. Yeah, it's like baby poop, right? Whereas mm -hmm. the palette that I have up here looks like it goes down to red. Uh, the problem with doing it this way is that it actually it does deaden your drawing. Uh, so the way I actually build my palettes is I think about color temperature. So if I were to rebuild this palette, I would actually then start scooting a little bit towards red each time. Moving down, scooting towards red. Oop, what happened just now? Scooting down, move towards red. And I keep doing that with each build until I get down to like you know a nice rich red color and what this does is it creates then a palette instead of like this it's like this you know and what this is called is color temperature so you're moving the value and you're moving the hue so no one explains this better than this guy um, uh, Jeremy Vickery Jeremy Vickery actually worked as the lighting director for Pixar and he has a DeviantArt account. It's actually uh, this right here. But he has this really great demo image, and it's using exactly what, the, what I was just explaining. So here's that yellow color, and it's moving down that scale towards black. And though it's moving down in value and creating a darker color, uh, it's not quite as vibrant as this right here because this is moving down in value and going down in hue. So it's based on intensity. So we call this based on color temperature because what it looks like is this is really, really bright, and it's getting fiery as it moves down. So what happens is he's rendered a little image here of a Lego man. Let me zoom in, actually. He's rendered an image of a Lego man. Based on this value, you can see that this is what the result was versus this color palette where he's rendered the same Lego man using this as the color temperature. You can see here that this little Lego man looks a lot more alive, a lot more vibrant, something more real than this guy. This guy kind of looks cold and lifeless, whereas this looks like warm. Even the table surface, which is pure white, has a little touch of the uh, the red in it, so that's why you know, it's important. They're both, they're both actually lifeless, though. You know. <laughs> Sorry. <I'm>... No. <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. I apologize. So that's why I'm it's ask, really important. I'm asking. I'm asking more because I wasn't sure. Because <laughs> color temperature is so effective. It is. So, that is why this right here. Uh, the palette that I created, it really thinks about color temperature. Even even value, you can make, this is not truly black or gray. You can see I've stepped it over towards a warmer color so that my warmth is then shown up in the drawing. So anything nope. that I'm like, hmm? Shouldn't your, so with your yellow, you were moving towards red. With your green, are you moving towards blue or? Well, are because this is going to be a warmer image, I'm actually keeping a, a warmer value. So if I if I kind of go through this, you can see here it's down about there. You can see here I actually stepped it down towards the red and then moved over. So I'm actually color temperature for me in this image is all warm. 
So all the colors, even if they're cool colors, kind of moves towards warmth as they go down in shade. Do that. No. It all has to do with the mood and atmosphere in your image and what you want to do with it. This one's just more warm than it is cool. But yes, you can go down cool. Like this is a cool color already, but I've I've chose kind of like a limeier green that's closer to yellow than closer to blue. You know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying. Okay. So that's why this right here looks bad compared to all of this stuff here. So let's get rid of that. So now we know a little bit about color temperature. Let's go back to Bowser and think about where we're gonna place some of those colors on his person. So when I do my color blocking, I'm usually pretty sloppy. Like I just kind of overlap everything because I know that later on I'm going to be redoing some of those areas. And it's all under the line art, so I don't really have to worry about being too accurate up front. But now that we know about color and lighting, you can see I'm kind of placing the darker colors in the shaded area and the brighter colors towards the highlight. But yeah, I'm gonna just go ahead and kinda fill this a little bit in. But yeah, I usually just grab a big brush and then just really just kinda go at it. You know, his body isn't that color, is it? It's like this color. Yeah, why am I forgetting this? I love Bowser, Like he's like one of my favorite characters. You know, well, we may never know. And actually, it's interesting that you chose uh, warmer colors because Bowser's such a cool, a cool guy. <laughs> uh, credit to pro amateur in the chat for a little nugget. Oh, uh, nice! Well done. I love it. Mm. I don't think I did it right, but anyway, you understand what I'm saying. I uh, you got the colors there. Oh, did I? Okay, the shell's yeah. green too. I think. All right. The shell is. Green too. But yeah, so really quickly, I'm kind of placing those shadows in. And again, this is one of those things that I have already finished. So I'm actually going to run up, turn this one on, and go with this. So this is essentially pretty much everything I was just doing, just cleaned up a little bit, just because I don't want to bore everyone in the uh, stream. But anyway, th this is basically how I arrive, and I feel like, yeah, that's, that's looking pretty good. I, I think remembering the the direction of the lighting we've got the highlights coming from this way the shadows going this way at this step usually what I do is I start doing okay I usually use a little bit more um, shadow in this stage so what I do is I usually take the smaller brushes and then kind of come up here and kind of add sections where I think it should be a little darker and these are like detail sections basically So you got your initial color blocks down, and now you're detailing? Yeah, just just a touch, just so I like know where I'm going to be placing some of those shadows. Like when I'm painting, I'm not grabbing for more colors while I'm painting. Usually the palettes are pretty established by the time I get to the render. So what you're doing right now is not the render. This is establishing yeah, color base? Still yeah, I'm still under the lines. I'm still working on making sure that uh, that I've got the, the depth that I want. Because like, if I start removing this, you see how some of the depth is vanishing as I remove it. So like areas like right in here, because the arm is uh, casting a shadow onto the body, I want to make sure uh -huh. that I'm capturing some of that depth. Oop, what, there we go. So this I is usually see. the time where I start adding just a touch more shadow in there. So again, this is one of those little time-consuming processes that you, this is like a nitpicking thing that I've already finished. I'm going to turn this guy off. But this is basically where I arrived after I put in all the shadows. If I, if I um, turn this layer off, you can see that it's really just depth and detail. That's all that I did there. So when I get to this point, uh, I look at my image. I kind of take the t opportunity to zoom out and really look at it. I step back and forth a lot and try to look at areas where I think, well, okay, it's nice, but I feel like it's still not quite stepped into the right amount of shadow yet. And here's where you can use, uh, here's where you can use blend modes to your advantage. So Photoshop and a lot of other programs have um, utilities called blend modes. What we're gonna blend do is modes. create a, yeah, blend modes. It's basically making a layer of light, of light interaction. So oh. let's make the or clipping mask again. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to go up here. This is all the different kinds of blend modes that Photoshop has. There's all sorts of crazy ones, but the one we're going to focus on right now is called Overlay. All this does is now then told Photoshop that every color that appears on this layer now will interact with this layer, in a, uh, or any, actually any layer underneath it. If I unclip that, every layer underneath it will uh, change. So this is the way that um, you can create quick light and shadow. So I, I just grabbed a really big airbrush here. I'm going to grab like a dark, kind of warmish color. And I'm going to knock down the opacity just a little bit because it tends to be strong. And I'm going to say like, okay, well right here, I think it needs to be darker. Right here, it needs to be darker. Right here, I think it could be a little darker. Uh, and then just kind of brush in some shadows. Now, this is an easy way and kind of a, a cheaterly way of putting in shadows, especially when you're kind of moving quick and you want to do like big, big shadows without destroying the work you've already done. Let me turn that off. You can see what it's done here. See that? Huh. So, okay, yeah. Like, what is, what is the algorithm behind overlay? Is it like? Oh my gosh, I don't know the math. But, I, mean, I mean, you're, you can... you're applying darkness, and it's doing it in a way that's not just making it darker. Right. So if I turned it off and went back to normal, you can see here that now it's the color interaction is gone. Right. It's opaque. It's actually that this color, just all on top of everything. You know and overlay is just going to then enrich the color maintaining the the temperature essentially like i can do it hmm. uh, multiply and you can see it deadens a little bit but then it doesn't lose some of the detail work that I, like especially here in the leg you can still see it but this is uh, multiply is good for like an actual shadow if i want to maintain the uh temperature i usually go to overlay or soft light which is slightly lighter or hard light which is a lot rougher but you see more of the um the true color coming through so basically so, it's magic. Yeah, it's a yeah, precisely. It's magic. It's okay. math magic. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm a math magician. And you can do Shout the same out to thing. all you math wizards out there. <laughs> you can do the same thing with the highlights. Now I try to avoid using white because white blows everything towards white and actual white. So what I do instead is I usually grab the highest highlight color, which in this case is not white but kind of yellow, and then use that as my highlight color. As you can see, there it kind of brings everything into sh into a uh, highlight. Let's watch this section right here as I turn it off. So really quickly, I added just a huge amount of highlight and shadow, just with that big airbrush and overlay. And you can always play with the opacity, like whoa, that's too intense, or maybe that's not enough. So I usually kind of go up to sixty or seventy, just play around with it, and I step back and I take a look. Okay, well, does that add? Is that better or worse? I say, yeah, it's good, uh, and usually commit it. Again, it's one of those step situations back. where, yeah, step back, like step away from your step, painting, like a like a Monet. Yeah, like when you even if you're traditionally painting, you should take the time to step away from your painting so you can see it at distance. So when you're like so this close to it and you're hyper focusing on it, you're not seeing the big picture. Like a Monet. Like Monet, yes. get it? Yes, yeah, okay. Because <laughs> you so look anyway, at stuff from far away. Yeah. <laughs> so you turn that off. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say that I already took care of this. This this is essentially the same thing. I I spent the time to kind of tweak the, uh, the shadows and everything. Um, and I was pretty satisfied with where we arrived on it. So looking at Bowser, I think he has good, strong highlights. And we lost Josh again. We have good strong highlights and good uh, dark shadows, but there's something missing from him as far as lighting. And again, we'll think about that ball where we had the lighting coming in from one direction, hitting that ball, going past that ball, and then hitting that surface, and then casting light back at that, and that's called reflected light. Occasionally in the, uh, the streams, you'll hear me refer to that as backlighting. I'll ask like, well, what, sh what color should my backlighting be, pink or purple or whatever? Uh, that's all it is, just the reflected light or a third light source that's coming from another direction just to make the character pop out from the background a little bit. In this situation, we're going to use blue just because I think that the backlighting will be a little cooler. And we'll just go ahead around the edges of the, the character. We're going to go ahead and add some of that backlighting. Why can't I? There we go. So like here on the fingers here on that that cool bracelet he has 
Now, is blue chosen randomly, or is this something that's going to have a relation to the background at some point? It, it is the background uh, because I know what the background is already. <laughs> right. And I, I know that it has that cooler look to it, so I chose blue. If I, if I had them like at a nightclub, I'd probably put like pink, or purple, pink. or yeah. But here we're just kind of touching the edges of all the stuff that's facing the direction that I think that that backlighting would be coming in or that reflected light and kind of just touching up some of those. And already you can see as I flip this on and off, it's adding a little bit of pop to the figure and causing him to look a little more 3D just because we're having that reflected light coming back. And uh, here it is. <laughs> oh, I guess I didn't go with the blue. It was kind of a, a lighter blue that I actually picked. But that, that's essentially the same idea is that uh, the, the lighting coming from the other way is just a different color than your highlight highlight. Um, and in this situation, my highlight color was probably more like a yellowish, like an ivory color, I think. <clears throat> you know what? Uh, one of the things we're missing here in, in your pre-prepped layering thing is that you are always combining your layers constantly throughout this process. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't want to show it in the workshop just because I don't I feel like that sabotages people when they're trying to learn. Um, mm. If you're trying to learn, I wouldn't do it quite as often as I do it because then you can't really go back and see what happened or whatever. If you need to maintain like all the layers you created so you can really figure out what's doing what, that's probably better. So I don't want to get I don't want to give people the idea that they should be merging down as much as I do. I think normally when you see me working, it's usually one or two, maybe three layers. But now we're at that stage where when I look at the, the color in this guy, I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty satisfied. I like how he looks. I like the lighting. I like the backlight, the reflected light. I'm ready to now commit the lines. So a lot of people ask, well, why do you even have the lines? And it's really for that process you just watched. I did everything under the line art so that I could be as messy as I want. I used the clipping mask so I didn't have to erase around the edges. And now what I have to do is get rid of those lines. So an easy, easy, easy way to get rid of lines is just to take that line art layer, go up to the um, the blend mode palette, and then go to overlay, and they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, because I'm not very clean underneath that, uh, you'll see it has these ragged edges. Uh, oh, but and that that's nice. It, it could be. It's just not that's the way I do it. Yeah. All right. That's just not the way I do it. So let's go back to normal. So the way I do it is actually to create a new layer, create that clipping mask, and now we're, what we're going to do is actually paint the lines themselves. So I, I hope that this makes sense because it's probably the number one question I get, like how do I make the lines disappear? Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a selection of the color from the base, the color layer, and remember I'm painting the lines now, so it's a clipping mask above the line art. I'm going to take that selection and I'm actually going to paint the actual lines. And the reason I'm taking the selection from the local color is so I can make sure that that line is kind of disappearing. Like this, I need to just go away. And then the edges of the hair, all the same thing. And the line art is kind of vanishing. It's still there, so if I turn it off, you can see that the line's still there. Uh, but it's giving me that clean air edge that I wanted here and here. Now the reason I, I have I like this opportunity to paint the lines because what happens is a situation like this if I take the uh, area that's next to the line and then actually paint it didn't really do what I wanted and when I go to render this is actually gonna look really bad so at, in the sections like this I actually want to step back and make it darker because that's an area where I think some of the shadow would be so I want to maintain that darker color in that area same with the eye he's got like the biggest eyebrows in this drawing. He's got big eyebrows. That's just his thing. He, he does. They're, you, they're the kind of like wriggle up and down. <laughs> so yeah, that's pretty much how I make those lines disappear. Like how I have that dark area here. I like how that it's bringing in a lighter area here. I can even exaggerate it by going up a step and causing the lines to be even lighter in that area. Chain chop here. Same thing. Make the lines disappear. And I'm just color selecting around as I go around this sphere so that I don't have to color them again when I get to the render. But that's essentially it. That is all that is. So let's go ahead and pretend I did that all. So this Pretending. is what the lines, Whoa. yeah. 
yeah, the lines are all painted in this situation. So if I if I go ahead and turn the paint off on the lines, you see they're black. Here they are with the line. And if I turn off the base layer, that is what the line art looks like without those colors underneath. It actually looks pretty cool. That's a style. It's a style. Yay. Yep. So let's turn those back on. And in this situation, what I do is I commit all three layers, the painted line art layer, the lines themselves, and the background. And I just smash them all together. Now they're all one. And this is where the bulk of the painting actually occurs, is actually in what we, what we re keep referring to as the render. It's actually just the painting part of the process. So I don't really now think about how the lighting is in a big scale. All I'm now thinking about is the smaller scale. So. This is where the rotate tool comes in handy for me. So how long would it take you to get to this part of the drawing normally? Um, I mean, it probably depends to, on complexity, but. Yeah, the, this is the like the final stage for me. So, this, But this uh, is like the Zen part of it, though. Like once I get to this part, my brain's checked out. Like I'm not doing anything except for like actually painting, you know, because I've already done the, the hard stuff think uh, thought wise right I've, I've already thought about the lighting I've already thought about how the colors I use the palettes already been built at this stage now I'm just making sure that the lines are not line arty and rather they look like they're painted into the figure so like percentage wise how much what percentage of the drawing process is this rendering painting time wise it? it's it's probably the greatest part of it uh, because time wise this is where all the detailing all the little like uh, the brush works go, you know, because earlier you saw the brushes I was using were huge, right? You know, they were meant so to be. Make... Hmm? Right, I'm, I'm still going to make you commit. So it was like 80% of the drawing, 70%? Probably 50. 50, okay. Mm -hmm. Whereas every other component is like 10%, 10%, 10%. Yeah, and that's really just time. If I were talking about effort, right. um, the effort, this is very little effort for me. Like, this is just like, like I said, this is like the fun part for me because I don't have to think about the hard stuff. Remember the so section that we said we, I wanted to maintain the darker part is now I can color select here and pull that up into the hair. But yeah, like I said, this is this is all just getting it zooming in in there and making sure that I'm, I'm making making the lines look a little more blended in. You know, areas that look rough still because I didn't clean them up in the earlier part, I just kind of blend those out again. And blending is just me selecting between two layers or two sections and grabbing the, the color that I need from those sections. How often would you say you are grabbing new colors entirely? Or are they like all going back to the there? palette and getting something new? Yeah. It's only in those situations where I need a darker color. Like in here, if that wasn't dark enough, I have nothing else to select from. So I've got to go in and actually go down with it. Hmm. Yeah. Those are and like even in here. Once that's in there, I'll take that same color just for time saving and like put that up in there. But yeah, I mean, again, this is a long, arduous process, but a, a very easy one. Uh, it's the the fun stuff. But let's go ahead and just. What, what are you? Okay. There we go. So this is like the full thing without. Um, without everything done. So like here's what I was just working on. Here's everything with the paint already done. You can see it's pretty much the same thing. That nice thing about retaining the line art and just painting them in is that it's. It's already kind of formed the figure for you. I'm just getting rid of them for an aesthetic view. So let me pop that off. Sorry, so this is the post render drawing. Yes, this is everything, just taking what I had and making sure the line art kind of dissolved into the image. At this point, when I look at it, it still needs detail work. And detail work for me is usually between like this brush and this brush. This brush is just a little scratchier, acts more like an oil brush. Uh, here's what it looks like. It's it's a little rougher, uh, but it's smoother between between the strokes. It's just rougher on the, the upstroke and downstroke. Whereas the scratch brush is rough around every edge. Well, can't really see anything. It's rough around every edge. So it has more of a feather. This is more like a loaded oil brush. And then this brush, is more like a liner. So I usually take the liner brush and use that to detail edges that I think need to be a little more crisp. So if I need like strands in here, it's the liner that I'm usually using. 
that's the same one you use for line art. Yep, it's a great brush. I love it. That's one of those ones it, where I'm like, yes, it's perfect. And it has a like a very hard edge, or is it sort of fuzzy? So it, if you look at it, a big view of it, it has a really smooth like lead in, and well, I didn't do it right, but it has a really smooth lead in and lead out. So hmm. that's why it makes really good like lines because you can well it made a shoestring but you can see here it's really smoothness like between the the stroke and it's really good for small detail just because when it's smaller it's easy to control yeah all right cool yeah so here i think his little butt face butt thing needs to come out a little bit more cleft face cleft face does he have a butt chin like <laughs> uh no i don't think he does i can't remember you know uh, you can actually add the... it, he does, does a little he? bit oh, okay. yeah here i'm just adding some horn detail a little scratchy marks in there and then um the eyes that i do actually let me i'm gonna go ahead and this is what it looks like with all the rendered detail in there like using that brush like if i were to just wow. spend a little more extra time yeah, like if I turn it, that off and turn it back on. It seems a lot sharper suddenly. Yeah, because that, that so the when I, the scratch brush is what the majority of the painting part that I did makes very fuzzy edges. <laughs> Whereas uh, when I use that detailer, this thing, that's why I go back and I'm like, oh, some of these edges, they need to be more crisp. That's why it's like that here. <clears throat> so this is, everything has basically detail on it now. You can see here that I've like put in some horn detail and put detail strokes of hair and everything. But um, a lot of people also ask me how I do the eye shine, so we're gonna do that now. The eye shine. <coughs> yeah. So for the eye shine, I usually take like the sclera color or a little step lighter. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and I'm using that detail brush again. And I just make like a mark. Well, actually, the lighting would be this way. And then kind of put a little dot there, too. Now, the problem with just doing white like that is that it, it's OK. But what I like to do is I like to double click this layer. What it's going to do is it's bringing this layer style option. What I go down to is this one, outer glow. I'm going to change this to red because his eyes are red. <laughs> And what this does is see here, it's adding like a bit of a, like a glow, an outer glow. <laughs> Very well. <laughs> and uh, what it does is it introduces a rim of glowing red color. And you can change this to anything, like, but red is where I'm arriving right now. And what that does is it creates a situation where it looks like the light's coming down, hitting his eye, and then reflecting his eye color into the highlight. And that just, without it, it's just this kind of, just a shine, but this gives it a little bit more life. Um, and if you want, yep. Yeah. Just to back you up for a second, when you initially made the shape of the that shine, you did it at a different diagonal, and then oh, you said, like "No, I that's not it. the right direction." Yeah. Why is that? Why was that not the right direction? Because, because his eye. People's eyes are a, a sphere, right? So it like. Oops. We think about his eye and being inside the socket with his pupil in the front like this you know mm -hmm. if i if i were to draw like the actual guidelines for his eye it would be a round eye right so the light would come in and hit his eye the reflections would be like this right not like this they would follow the uh, curve of that eye which is why right, i said no, okay. they're, they're going the wrong direction which is the only reason i kind of backed up and did it the other way mm -hmm. so anyway i just usually commit that too so anyway, there's Bowser. That's what he looks like with pretty much all the detail work, everything he has. That's pretty much how I render a figure. So what we're going to do is now shift gears and talk about how I use um, basically all the rest of these brushes, all of them that are not these three, <laughs> all these ones that we haven't talked about at all. The reason I have so many brushes is because most of them are actually um, a way for me to make backgrounds or to make texture like fur or things like that and we'll, we'll talk about each of them if i can these tend to behave poorly on stream just because of the lag but we'll see how far we can get so let's go ahead and shift gears and do the background 
so I already kind of picked a palette color for the background. Uh, I knew that I kind of want to do this like blue color, so let's go ahead and fill that in. Quickly, I can say, okay, well, I, I want him to kind of have like a background that's kind of like a, this blue color with maybe like centrally focused, like put this kind of like nice highlight in the middle. What brush are you using right now? I'm using a giant airbrush just so I can get it done quicker. It's got very, very smooth edges. And I know that I want grass down here like this. I promise you it will be green. There we go. You put the darker green down first? Yeah, just because I like to step from the bottom up. Oh, and I see it's I, on the edges there. Yeah. So now I have like a nice highlight spot, like a stage basically where he's going to sit. And I'm going to just introduce a little bit of purple into this background just so it's not all blue. All right. So that's that's where we have a nice little stage for him to sit on. Uh, now, doing the background, one of the things that I do a lot uh, is make trees. And I, I think if you've watched the stream before, you might see me using this brush right here. This is a chalk brush. I also use this brush for a lot of texture as well, but for right now I'm going to just build trees with it. So I'm going to take a nice dark blue because as we, if we imagine that this section right here is going to be full of trees like a forest, I don't want to make them literally brown uh, because they're going to be kind of affected by the environmental lighting or the atmosphere. So they're going to kind of look more bluish. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go ahead and make some lines. Just some random ones. There we go. Make, maybe put a little couple of branches in there too. Everybody knows what a tree looks like. Do we? Yeah, I think so. I, hope I so. think trees are brown. You're wrong. So oh. I'm going to make a new clipping, <laughs> clipping mask that's going to affect just those trees. And with this chalk brush, what's really nice about it is that you can kind of just lightly, just very, very lightly touch these trees, and we're quickly making aspens. These are aspen trees? Yeah, they have that like rough bark texture, right? Sure. I mean, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of barks are rough. It's Barkers they're, they're, well, go they're, rough. Their bark is worse than their bark. Rough, rough. So I'm going to choose a lighter color now, uh, and I'm going to just go along just the edge to introduce just a bit of highlight to the tree. And I'm, I'm pretending like lighting sources are coming from like this way, so I'm going along like that side of the tree that would be kind of in light. And then one more time, and put in a little bit more texture. I'm not touching, I'm very, I'm touching very, very lightly. A chalk brush tends to like to lay down colors really thick. Uh, let me get rid of that. So let's go ahead and commit that. and. The reason I didn't put a lot of time and effort into this is because I'm actually going to go up and I'm going to use Gaussian Blur and I'm actually going to blur those into the background. They're really just, uh, you know they're trees because we, obviously what they are, but the little bit of texture that we did do is showing up still and they go into the background. So really quickly, I've just built up a little forest and I know that Josh has called me out on this before, but you can actually duplicate it, turn it around. Oh. And then go one more time, another Gaussian blur. And these trees are even further back. But anyway, quickly, we're, we're just creating a set of trees with very, very little effort. So the nice thing about some of the brushes is if you don't, even if you didn't want to do this, I do even have brushes in there that they'll just generate trees for you. So let's do it. Yay. Now those are evergreen, except they're blue. <laughs> so yeah, you can do a lot of things. Like we, I'm adding just like a bunch of trees really quickly. Um, you can actually add little tiny bushes in really quickly too. Now what emotional state would you say those trees are? I'd say they're probably sorrowful. They are little. Just a little bit. But anyway, so let's, let's go. <laughs> they're sad little trees. <laughs> But uh, I can also add like um, 
other kinds of bushes in here. Make basically make them the same way. But if you if you do download my brush pack, uh, go ahead and play around with them. You'll find that some work better for you uh, than others. I usually make grass with um, this little. I don't know what this is. This shape, but basically it's the shape that it makes when it makes the grass. It's a sconce. Is that it? <laughs> this is just <laughs> adding. <laughs> This is adding just a bit of texture to the ground, basically. I use this a lot when we did the Mimi Q drawing, actually. Hmm. Um. Why did you use a blue for the background of the the left side of the bushes? I don't know. I just grabbed the wrong color. Ah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But yeah, this this is what this does is just add a bit of texture. I also like to use um, where did you go? This this little section three ninety eight for grass also. It adds actual patches of grass. But yeah, that it's it's pretty easy to build a background with a lot of these brushes. This is um, this section right here. This is actually rocks. Rocks. Mm -hmm. This one right here. This is flowers. Kind of looks I mean, like gotta, flowers. Yeah, you got to go back and kind of color them in, but you get the idea. Uh, there's also cloud brushes. Can't really see them past my trees. There we go. You know, or if it's not like daytime, you could actually go down and use the uh, star brushes. But yeah, I mean, Stars. all the all the brushes do something something to make texture essentially. After this point. Uh, and even like Bowser's chain chomp like guy, his chain, which for some reason I drew by hand, I could actually have just drawn it as a chain. I love that one <laughs> with the size pressure. Yeah, because if you touch lightly, it's smaller, and then it, as you touch harder, it's <gasps> got closer. It did. Ooh, yeah. and stars. Yep. <laughs> but anyway, I I already did the background uh, before we got started. Uh, it ended up looking like this, but I use the same. I use the same brushes. Like these are those bush brushes. I use the same chalk brush for the trees, those same grass brushes for the bottom. If we pop our Bowser in there, you can see he sits nicely. You have to, of course, integrate your your drawing in. Sometimes I'll go through and I'll make sure that he's looks like he's actually sitting on the ground. Where's that grass brush? You know, so I put the grass up in front of him so it doesn't look like he's just floating there. And those those uh the star brushes I use I also use those as sparkles. La 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 la. la. <laughs> <laughs> but that. Well, that is a star. It, yeah, it, the star is making its own stars. Like those yeah. are its babies. <laughs> no, those are its tears. <laughs> that makes it way more sad. Is that why the chain chomp's sad? It's like, oh god, what's the matter with you? <laughs> What's Bowser doing with that finger? He's sapping its life energy. <laughs> Jeez. So this anyway, is why that's... Chain Chomp is so ornery. Yeah. So that's the finished drawing. If I take all of these layers here and smash them down together, uh, we can go ahead and just take... I'm going to just go ahead and... So it's not confusing. I'm going to get rid of all the other layers now. Um, yeah. A lot of times when I'm finished with a drawing, I also like to make sure that I'm... I'm the lighting looks good. Like you can go to curves. Curves is a tool that you can use the. It's using the lighting levels and the hue, and kind of push it up and down for see what effect you want. You know, it'll make the colors a little richer, a little darker. And all of these are tweaking tools. So like, if I turn that off and on, you can see what it's doing. You can also use the blend modes to do something similar with a little bit more control. Whoops. Okay. Like if I wanted maybe like an intense amount of the. Uh, the orange or yellowy highlight, I can come in and here and make it look like he's almost glowing off the edges. Or maybe this guy's like <gasps> even more glowy. <laughs> um, you can also just tell Photoshop to decide for itself what it thinks is best. 
I just did auto tone. It decided that I had too much red in the drawing, so it made it more blue. Auto tone is another just magic. Yeah, tool. it's a magic tool. Yeah, they're all up here in image. Auto contrast does. Well, it looks like. Is it trying contrast. to say like, oh, well, you should have a certain number of this color and this color? Yeah, like the it's looking to balance the color in the image basically. And so, uh, doing everything, I actually used auto color in the final, and I just turned the final on. You can see that's pretty much the same thing. The only difference is that I added that little bit of grass at the bottom. But that's essentially it. That's that's my entire workflow. But anyway, I wanted to take this opportunity to let the chat ask questions if they have them. Uh, I know that was a lot of information that we kind of covered really quickly, but we did want to commit to like giving the chat maybe like 30 minutes to, to ask questions. Yeah, I've got a couple prepared for you here. Uh, the topic of tablets came up um, in the chat when you were first uh, showing the pressure sensitivity and everything. And the chat had some, some thoughts on that. And Wacom or Wacom, uh, depending it's, on who's, who, who's cool. I say Wacom because it's short for Washington computers. So Wacom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wacom, I, I think it, Wacom is the thing I hear most often, but um, that company is uh, sort of known for their tablets, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what would you say is, is the best tablet? What's the best to start with? What do you use? What would you like to be using? Or what would you recommend for a beginner and, or someone who's an expert? Um, okay, so essentially when you're asking about tablets, if you're just starting off, uh, I would get the Wacom into us. Uh, no? <laughs> I think it's like that's, this. <laughs> yep, that's right. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's because the tablet is, it's smaller. Uh, you know, I feel like they're a lot, I, so I have a, an Intuos Medium Pro. And that's what I use when I travel. It's I think it, the size is like uh, nine by twelve. I'm almost sure that it is. But I feel like it's a very good size. Uh, it's a really good introductory tablet. If you can get it, get that one. Don't get the smaller ones, just because you, just for saving money's purposes. I feel like that's a pretty good size for for most people. Whereas what I hear more often from the smaller sizes is that is the complaint is that it's too small. Nobody complains about nobody complains about this size, but it doesn't mean that you if you can't afford this particular one that you shouldn't get the smaller one. Go ahead and get any any of this brand, um, just because I think that that's what I used for. I'm gonna say. I think I used that for nearly 13 years. Why am I writing this down? So. I, I almost every drawing that you've seen in my gallery was made on one of these. Um, I decided then to step up to the Cintiq. So at one point I decided, you know what? I, I think that I might want to give this a go. The problem with the Cintiqs is that they're very expensive. So while you can get one of these from, I think like anywhere between like 80 to like, like $400, this right here starts at around like two grand, and I think it goes up to like four grand. <laughs> so you've got to be pretty serious about what you're doing. Uh, but the Cintiq is, you know, a screen, so it's got the big stand in the back. And I, I really like mine. It's got the little wheel on the side that I use to adjust my sizes. You know, but what you see on the screen is you're directly drawing on the surface, whereas this one's going to go to your monitor. There's nothing being shown on here. Everything what you're doing, you need to look up at your monitor. So the problem with this is that there's a little bit of a disconnect between looking at your monitor versus not looking at your hand, whereas this, you're looking at the, the actual screen and drawing in the same place, which is much more like how you would be traditionally. That doesn't mean you can't get used to this at all. Like, it, it is not that hard to get used to the, the tablet. If you are using it into us and you're just getting started with it and you do have a trouble with the idea of looking at your screen versus your hand, which is just doing like the alphabet and trying to write as straight as you can, you know, on a line. A lot of times the problem people have is they start going uphill with it just because it feels so weird to, 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 to go straight on it, essentially. 
and also try to draw like up um, and down and horizontal lines. Why should someone get a tablet? Oh, I, if you're going to be digitally painting, the amount of stress you're putting on your hand by using a mouse is absurd. Like the the way that you're going to be painting should feel like painting. It should feel like drawing. It should not feel like you've, your hand is like level with your table and you, you know you don't want your tool to be the thing that's getting in your way uh when you're when you're using an intuas you're going to be moving from your wrist you know to make these lines whereas with a cintiq the one of the big, biggest benefits with a cintiq is that it's bigger and since it's a screen like that you're looking at you're going to be pivoting from your elbow you know so you can imagine your your hands here <laughs> <laughs> that's a beautiful <laughs> but hey anyway, everyone you, this is yeah, how you draw you're going to be pivoting from, you know, your elbow versus your wrist because it's so big. The smaller strokes, yes, you're going to be pivoting from your, your wrist. But, like, large, big, uh, you know, lines like this, I'm actually moving my entire arm. Whereas lines like this, I'm moving from my wrist, which is what the Cintiq allows you to do. With the smaller tablets, I feel like you really don't get in a situation where you're, excuse me, you're using, like, a really big, big, long line. Unless you have a giant, you know, tablet. But the biggest benefit is workflow. Uh, so we had some questions earlier about uh, Sketchbook and whether or not Sketchbook has uh, the same clipping layers as Photoshop. Oh, clipping mask? Yeah, clipping it masks. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. No. So in Sketchbook, usually what I do is, um, you know, the line art will be present. You know, let me, you know, like I'll, I'll have the line art there, you know, and I'll put the layer underneath. And what ends up happening is... Uh, you know, I'll just start painting underneath it, and I won't care so much about the, uh, wow, my, my computer is not liking this. So I won't care so much about what's going on, like, out here, because in Sketchbook, what ends up happening is I, I usually just go ahead and clean it up by erasing around the edges. That's it. it the huh. clipping mask is not necessary. It's just one little step towards, you know, not having to do that thing where you're erasing around the edges or cleaning up. And that that's all. Cool. But um, and yeah, in sketchbook, what you'll see more, what you'll see me doing more often than not is actually incorporating some of the background into the the, the foreground, just so that it looks more painted. Uh, because I like sketchbook's feeling of like actual paint. It like feels more wet, whereas Photoshop feels more dry. And uh, what other programs have you do you use regularly or like to use? Really, right now it's all just Photoshop and sketchbook. That's pretty much it. Um, when like sketchbook is for different types of drawings or um, so sketchbook is you can use it as an app also uh, so it's nice to use you on mean on an iPad yeah and it, it's really built so that it's easy to use that way so you're not messing with a bunch of palettes sitting on top of the drawing like this uh, a lot of things you can use with your fingers to bring up menus which I think is really nice um, but I like, like I said, when I when I'm doing something in Sketchbook, it's usually because I want the more traditional feel, like the wetter feel that I would get with like really wet loaded air, uh, oil paints. Um, but I, I mean, I have some Sketchbook tutorials on my DeviantArt also, which it shows the process difference than I was using in Photoshop. I'm actually working on a Sketchbook tutorial right now. I'm hoping to put it up on Monday. Cool. So. Uh. This is maybe a bit more of a complex question now, but uh, how do you plan out your composition for your backgrounds uh, so that it seems it feels dynamic? Um, how do you background? How do I background? So if what I know is... I'm going to have a background, mm -hmm. um, a lot of times what I do is, you know, I'll, like, if I'm going to, I don't know, like, if I were going to draw, like, sands, you know, I'll start with the sands part of it. You know, he'll be here like, hey, hey, I'm going to tell a pun. <laughs> you know, have him sitting here or whatever. Um, as soon as I as soon as soon I get the figure to a point where, I, like, how I want him, like, he's, like, sitting at his, like, station or whatever. Uh, as soon as I get to this point, I think, okay, I'll, I'll probably block, color block th this section in. Like, I'll put the color block in here, but then I'll start building up the background so that the, I know what the color will be here because I want to know how it's going to interact with the color here. So at this point, usually I'll lay like, okay, uh, let's 
got a blue hoodie, right? You know, I'll usually color block the hoodie in. And then, you know, color block some of the, the other stuff in. Now, the issue is, since Sans is a uh, white character, he's going to be greatly affected. And it, this is true for anything, but since he's white, you know, the, the color that his face is going to be will greatly depend on what the color of the background would be. Like, if I had him in a forest, you know, I know that the forest might be blue. So that way, okay, well, I've got to take that in consideration when I'm going to white. So that white is not going to be truly white. It's going to have a bit of a blue tinge in it. Versus if he's in, like, hot land, you know, the background's probably going to be kind of a brighter orange color. Now that blue doesn't look right. So that means I need to come over and choose a color that would look more appropriate in that setting. It still gives the appearance that his skull is white. It's just that the, the uh, background is affecting the way we're perceiving that. And now even the blue doesn't look right. So I'd have to, like, you know, take a color that would give it the appearance that it looks right. You know, so maybe the shadows are more warm now. Uh, I do have one more question here. Uh, do you have any recommendations on drawing perspective? <laughs> uh, this person has, gets stuck on, on drawing stuff at a straight level. and um, uh, So if I you download my brushes... The different points of perspective. Yeah, if you download my brushes, this very last one here, that's actually a perspective brush. So Ooh. if you put it on a new layer and go ahead and like uh, set it down, I'm going to move back to... So this little cross here, that's just the vanishing point. So what I do is when I when I know I'm going to make a complex drawing where I know it's going to have like a lot of non-organic elements in it, like straight walls or whatever, even if it was a cavern, you should probably be building up your perspective in the beginning. So what I do is I kind of think, okay, well, let's say I wanted to draw sands in a cavern and I want the horizon drawing to be low, you know, because maybe I want him to be seen from the bottom. Those are the, like, loosely at the very least, you want to kind of think about those things in the beginning. What I usually do is I drop the opacity on that, and then I, I, I think about where the vanishing line is. Grendel, stop. And then I, uh, you know, I may start building, well, you know what, a cave is very hard to understand in this way. But, you know, I may, like, put in, you know, some of those buildings so that they start following that perspective. You know, doing doing the perspective stuff is, it's... My, my brush is acting weird because the stream is kind of locking me down. But, you know, maybe I'll have Sans here and he's kind of like at that low angle. Do the lines on the figure get influenced by the perspective lines as well? Yeah, think about the figure also. So like if his one shoulder's here, the other shoulder should be following that perspective line, which I didn't wow. do here. Yeah. So yeah, if you want, you know, just put in a loose perspective and that will help you maintain... Uh, Kind of, <laughs> what is he doing? So, you know, if there was another character standing next to him, like maybe Papyrus is standing up here, he should appear on that right, that uh, that line also. You know, so maybe one shoulder's here, one shoulder's here, and his his body's here. You know, and his leg is down here. So that way, you're already giving it that like very low angle, like we were looking up at them, like they're like we're laying on the ground or whatever. But yeah, so perspective building is is one of those things. Well, hold that, on, mm -hmm. hold on, don't don't delete it. Um, so what I find interesting is that you might in in one figure you might actually see like the underside of his chin and mm -hmm. then at the same time the top of his feet like there's different parts oh yeah and this visible and, because your your viewpoint is is very specific yeah so in this in this particular one since you mentioned it you would see like the lighting for the cheek the underlighting would show up like here right his cheek would be like that <laughs> <laughs> and then you would see the top of his slipper because at the the vanishing point is here. So you're looking up at his face, but you're looking down at his slipper. Does that make sense? Yeah, actually, I didn't think of it that way. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Um, what is foreshortening, though? So foreshortening... So if, if I were to draw... Let me drop this perspective because it's going to make it confusing. If I were to draw, like, you know, sans... <laughs> <laughs> everything is sans uh you know he's like low we're looking down at him right so that perspective is kind of coming up like this right if he was standing in a doorway he would kind of get smaller and smaller like his feet would be down here right and if his mm -hmm. hand was reaching the top of that doorway unlike 
breaking reality, basically, his hand would get bigger. I'm going to do another one of those. <laughs> his hand would be something like that, right? Because we're looking at we're looking at him along the perspective like this. So as as that starts to like if the vanishing point is down there, you know, it, it's going to all draw that way down towards that. That's that. So the the shoulders and the feet should kind of run in line with vanishing to that line there. If that makes any sense. That's why you see things like if Sans was here, like, hey, buddy. You know, and he was like, talk to the hand. You know, he'd have his hand up there, like, it'd be all big, and then it, need, it needs to recede down to his body, which would be, you know, the foreshortening was, is basically his arm. You know what I mean? And that's the shittiest drawing. But but the point is, is still, like, you know, if his arm was here and his hand was coming up like this, that tube that makes up his arm is, is running along a vanishing point, basically. You know, and then the, the feathery part of his, his jacket's there, and then his head's here. <laughs> I think this should be a new character. That's hey, the friends. Arby's guy. Let me, no, I think it's the, like, Chef Boy RD guy. Or no, uh, oh. Hamburger Helper. Hamburger Helper, yeah. I'm gonna help you paint! It would be really great, like, if he also had stupid-looking hands. <laughs> 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 or maybe one perfect hand. <laughs> oh, yeah. One, like the one hand that's like over here is just like super realistic. <laughs> oh, no, like God. it's really boxy. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Thank you for coming to the uh, digital painting workshop. It it really is great. Um, if you want to see more of these, let us know. I'm going to be doing a small mini series where I talk about some of the the other little things that I've been doing in my paintings that need probably more time, like how to make water or how to do some of the background stuff. Uh, but that that's to come. We do, every, like Josh says, we do a stream pretty much every Wednesday at eight o'clock where we've been drawing a lot of Pokemon. Every once in a while we'll do one on Friday or Saturday where we do a bigger drawing. Uh, but yeah, give us a, give us a sub if you like what we're doing. Um, also put these streams on YouTube. If you didn't catch one or it's not an archive anymore, uh, give us a, a like or a comment there. But yeah, thank you for joining this stream. It's it's really great to see so many people here uh, with the same interest in digital painting. It's uh, really nice. So that's uh, Saushin on DeviantArt, Twitch, YouTube, Tumblr. And you can find me at Josh Worlds on DeviantArt and Tumblr. Yeah, you can also find him harassing me in the comment section on my drawings. I love doing that. <laughs> Smell you later! Up.